right. Good morning, Fusion Community Church. How's everybody doing this morning? All right. Comfy in the AC this morning. Um, yeah, we're just going to worship God this morning um, and thank him for, for all the good and wonderful things that he blesses us with each and every day. Um, every breath we take, every moment we get to, to be awake and alive in this world is a blessing and a miracle from him. And uh, we are just going to celebrate that this morning as a family. So sitting or standing, whatever makes you most comfortable, um, we're just going to worship together this morning. worshiping with us this morning. I hope you all got a... <laughs> JB's back in the house. 
Um, I hope you all got a worship guide as you walked in through the doors. Um, if you didn't get one, just let me know. Inside, you'll see these communication cards. And this is something that we ask everybody fill out each week that you come. Pardon me. Um, this is how, and we're really hoping that you do fill this out. Communicate with us. Let us know that you're here. Um, you can let us know what's happening in your life. Um, praises or prayer requests, you can mark on the back. And then stick that in the basket as you head out um, later after the service. Um, if you're watching online, you can still communicate with us through fusioncommunity.church forward slash interact. You can check in through there. You can check out the kids' services that way as well. So definitely check that out. Um, yeah, so the band is going to continue to play. If you guys need anything at all, just come and see us. Thanks. Lord, it was you who created the heavens. Lord, it was your hand that put the stars in their place. Lord, it is your voice that commands the morning, even oceans and their waves will bow at your feet. Lord, who am I? Compared to your glory, oh Lord, Lord, who am I compared to your majesty? I am your beloved, your creation. You love me as I am. You have called me chosen for your kingdom. Unashamed to call me your own. I am your
sin that we might become his righteousness he humbled himself and carried the cross the so amazing love so
As we pray this morning, I just want to invite you just to open your hands right in front of you and just kind of as a sign of, of, of kind of releasing things to God that maybe you're carrying this morning, maybe, maybe things with your family, maybe things with your career, maybe, maybe things with uh, friends or, or just the state of this world, just burdens that are weighing you down. And, and, you know, we're invited in Scripture to cast our cares upon Him, to kind of bring things to the foot of the cross. But in kind of the opening of your hands, we're releasing it, knowing we don't have control. But our hands are also open to receive what God has for us today. So it's kind of a hunger not only to, to unload before the Holy Spirit and the power of God at work through the Holy Spirit, but it's also a, a hunger to want to receive exactly what God wants to speak to us individually as we're here in this place. Lord Jesus, we do, we do more than just sing the, the words on the screen. All our hope is in you. God, we're, we're, we've experienced this year what life looks like if our hope is in our circumstances, if our hope is in, 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 in uh, our own control over things when we know, God, that it's been ripped away. The reality of how little we actually have control over reminds us, it gives us hope in your sovereignty that you are in control, that you've never lost control. Lord, I know that, that even right now that there's so many, all of us, both in this room and online, that, God, there's things weighing us down. There's things that bother us. There's things we wish we could change whether it be in an individual basis or, or a, a, on a national basis or a global basis, things we wish we could change and we don't have that authority. And so we open our hands before you, we place it before your feet and we pray one thing, your will be done. We pour out our hearts to ask what we want and what we would hope to see and our desires and our dreams. But ultimately, God, we know we're limited. You are not. And what we ultimately want is you. We want your plan, your will in our lives and in this world. And we look forward with great anticipation to the return of your son. And we know that everything that you allow to happen is a part of be preparing us for Jesus' return. So we trust you with that, God. We pray all the, the things that, that burden us. We ask your will to be done in them on earth as it is in heaven, in your sovereignty. But God, we also ask with a hungry spirit that we would hear your voice speak to us directly. That God, maybe there's something we're carrying that doesn't resemble Jesus, doesn't reflect Jesus in our circle of influence, in the way we live our lives. And maybe today, God, your spirit wants to bring that to the surface and convict or challenge or stretch us to a place that, if we're honest, is uncomfortable, but maybe it's exactly what you want to do. So God, we don't lean into the message today as we continue this walk through the book of Acts with our agenda in mind, but we yield to your agenda, Jesus. Whether we're here in this room gathered together in one group or, or spread out and scattered across wherever those joining through a live stream might be this morning. Your Holy Spirit is effective and powerful when we yield. So we yield to you, Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. At this time, all of our kids ages 4 through 6th grade can kind of go ahead and move to the back of the room. And our Takuma Island team is ready to kind of take them in towards the barn for their own custom experience uh, for our kids. So have fun. Boys and girls, we'll see you guys soon. God is tapping me on the shoulder. I'm here for something more. And I know it. I feel it. I'm no longer willing to spectate. It's no longer enough for me to just sit and listen. He's calling me. And I have to wonder, is he calling you too? The very first verse of Acts chapter 8 says this, A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem, and all the believers except the apostles were scattered. 
Now, if you were one of them, if you were there, one of the 10,000 new believers in Jesus in the capital city of Judaism, this would appear to be really, really bad news. Because this new family that you're a part of, this huge congregation that's been gathering together face to face over and over again for months throughout Jerusalem and specifically within the temple courts, Solomon's portico, and sometimes daily in its initial stages, daily gathering together. Now all of a sudden, in an instant, it all changes and you're no longer safe to gather in the capital city. The question is, what do you do? I mean, could you possibly imagine what it would be like if we could no longer gather in one place as the church? <laughs> right? Maybe a, six months ago, we would have said, yeah, what, that's, that's crazy. Now we, our story kind of resembles that a little bit more. We, we know what that's like. We know what it feels like to no longer be able to gather as the church. So the question for them at this time is, everything's changing. Does this mean it's over? Does this mean that God's no longer in control? Does it mean the church is going to fade? That it was just a fad for a little while, but now it's not going to last? Or maybe it is in the middle of bad news. God wants to remind us that, there's, that his good news will always triumph. 10,000 new believers across Jerusalem collectively realize at the execution of Stephen, we can't stay here anymore. And the family of God scatters in all directions. And yet as it does, your heart aches because your church family has been divided. It's been isolated. Your heart aches because you miss these people that you've fallen in love with over time in a short amount of time, just a few months, and, and you've, you've discovered who they are and you're serving alongside them and you're generously supporting one another and you're being sacrificial and you're growing in faith and you're hearing more and more about Jesus and experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit and you know when you go in opposite directions... This might be the last time you ever see them again. And so your heart breaks at the relational kind of schism that's happening. And even more than that, your heart breaks because someone that you knew, someone you respected, a young guy named Stephen, who had the world before him, you would see him humbly serving widows their food. He, would, he was doing things. He, was, he didn't care what it was. He didn't care the title or position. He just wanted to serve. He had been selflessly serving, giving of himself to meet needs, and he is senselessly murdered at the hands of the Jewish high council. They drag him into the street and they stone him to death. I mean, this guy hadn't hurt anybody. He cared about people. He was not a criminal. He had this incredible heart of love, and he would identify and serve those most people might walk right by, and they killed him. I mean, imagine after that event, many who loved Stephen, who respected Stephen, who saw such potential in Stephen, as he was elevated to be a deacon and to serve the church, they were angry. This is a legitimate anger. They were upset that an innocent man was murdered simply because what he spoke about, that he believed about Jesus, was seen as a threat to the Jewish system. And so they took him out, hoping to, to once again cut off at the source in fear and intimidation and threat this movement of Jesus' followers. You know, after an injustice like this, anger is an appropriate response. The presence of anger after someone suffers so horrifically tells the story that what happened is not okay. When that anger sits within us over something, we're like, this is an injustice. This is not okay. There's a moment there where our heart is connected with the heart of our creator that says this is not permissible. The early church would have wanted justice for Stephen to hold accountable those responsible for taking his life, but they would find no hint of justice whatsoever. Why? Because they lived in a Roman world. To the Romans, Jewish men and women were nothing. They had no value. They had no permission to speak. They had no advocates for them in the public sector. The Romans cared about two things. Roman citizens and tax collectors. It's really all they cared about. Roman citizens had a voice. Tax collectors, if you, as long as you're sending up the chain of command what's responsible, however you get it, we don't care. And what you want to add on to it for your own benefit, your own pockets, it's fine. But Rome better get what's coming to Rome. Caesar better get what's coming to Caesar. So the death of a young Hebrew guy who had a big heart, the Romans don't care. There's not going to be an investigation. There's not going to be suspects. They're not going to do interviews and gather evidence. There's going to be no interrogation. They're not seeking a confession. The Romans wouldn't waste a single dollar or a single second on trying to address this injustice. And the truth is, racism was alive and well across the Roman Empire. And we see it clearly, and we're going to see it clearly in Acts chapter 8 today what the reality of the culture was and how uniquely different the church of Jesus was. 
But racism was so prevalent that one of the most remarkable things about the early Jesus followers was the fact that they were an all-inclusive bunch in ever-expanding ways. It didn't matter where you came from. It didn't matter your background or your story or, or the depth of your sin. It didn't matter your skin color, your education. It didn't matter what you believed beforehand. It didn't matter how evil you were beforehand or how much money you had. The church of Jesus, light, it was reflecting Jesus himself in that it, it existed for all people. Anybody was welcome at the table of grace. Anybody can be a part of this family. I want to take you back for a minute, back to John chapter 17. Hopefully you're kind of seeing a theme here. Jesus' final words before he's arrested. We started in week one of, of the last series we, we were in, Won't You Be My Neighbor, with talking about John 14, 15, 16, and 17 before Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then jumping into the book of Acts out of that is Jesus was kind of helping them understand who the Holy Spirit was and what to look for when the Holy Spirit would arrive so they could have some sort of expectation. And they kind of missed it at the time until the day of Pentecost came and then they realized the significance of what Jesus was saying. When John chapter 17, Jesus has just spent three chapters talking about the Holy Spirit, trying to prepare them. And it's in John 17, literally the final moments before he's arrested in the garden. And then he's going to be taken before trial and uh, appear before Caiaphas and, and Pilate and Herod, and then ultimately be crucified. It's in his final moments, Jesus is going to offer a prayer to God the Father on behalf of the disciples he'll be leaving behind. And in John 17, you can turn there with me if you want, but, but we'll be in Acts chapter 8 for the majority of it, so if you're already at Acts 8, you can stay there. But if you want to go to John 17 with me, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And verse 6 says this, this is the middle of Jesus' prayer. It says, Lord, I have revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you. For I've passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from you and they believe you sent me. Father, my prayer is not for the world, get this, but for those you have given me. He's specifically praying for reconciled children of God through the gift of his life, through his sacrifice. He's going to talk about that in a minute. I, I'm praying for those you've given me because they belong to you. They bear your name. All who are mine belong to you and you have given them to me so they bring me glory now I am departing from the world. They're listening to this prayer. The disciples are like, huh? You're departing? Why do you keep talking about this? They are staying in this world. But I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. You know, it's interesting when Jesus prays this prayer of protection, he doesn't pray for typically how we pray for protection. You know, before a long road trip or before our kids are, you know, going to be out from under our umbrella for a while. Like, we often pray protection like, Lord, keep them safe and bring them back to us because we love our kids, we love our grandkids, we love our families and our friends. And we want them with us as long as we possibly can have them and we don't even want to think about losing them. And so we pray prayers of physical safety often. Jesus is praying for protection, but it's not physical safety. He's actually praying, God, keep them unified, keep them one. Protect my body these whom you've given me from division. Verse 14, he says, I've given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world. You know, in, in light of what we experienced over the last few months, there, there's been many of us crying out, why, why, why doesn't government, why doesn't our nation, why don't states see the church as essential? Jesus told us, they hate you because you don't belong to the world. They don't understand who we are or the mission, or our Messiah, our Savior. He says, the world hates them because they do not belong to the world. Other places in John, Jesus says, they hated me, they're going to hate you. Just as I do not belong to the world. Verse 15, he says, I'm not asking you, God, Father, to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. So there is a safety he asks for, but it's not one of physical safety, it's one of spiritual provision. They don't belong to this world any more than I do. We're now apart from this world, we're in this world, but not of this world. We have a new identity as children of God. Verse 17, make them holy, set them apart because of who they are. No, by your truth. The truth of God changing us sets us apart from this world even more. Teach them your word, which is truth. And then verse 18, he says this, just as you sent me into the world, that's the incarnation of Christ, God in his divinity stepping into our reality, just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. This is the incarnational ministry of the church where we are called not just to gather, but we gather for the purpose of scattering. We're carrying the gospel into every 
circle of influence that, that God has blessed us with, that he's opened the door for into every relationship we have. So Jesus is, is praying a prayer of, of the sending nature of God. As you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. His sacrifice is what provides this to become a reality. Verse 20, I'm praying not only for these disciples, the ones that are around him, the 12, but also for all those who will ever believe in me through their message. If you didn't know this, Jesus was praying for you in the garden. He's praying for you. If you're a follower of Jesus, he was praying this prayer over you. In verse 21, what does he pray? I pray for all those who ever respond to the message, they will all be one, just as you and I are one. There's a second time he's mentioning unity and a oneness in the church. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so the world will believe you sent me. There's this idea that the evidence of who Jesus is and that he was sent by the Father has to do with our unity. Verse 22, I've given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. Third time, I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity. Fourth time, that the world will know you sent me. And why was God sent? That you love them as much as you love me. So here we have, time and time again, in this final prayer over not only the disciples at the time, but all those who would believe the message of the gospel in the future, Jesus prays for unity, for the church to be one, to to not be divided, to not be polarized, but because of grace and love, be unified under the gospel. I think we could easily see that for the last couple of decades, we have seen just an ever-increasing polarization in our culture, and if we're not careful, we will allow it to begin to impact and leak into our understanding of who the church is. And we would be breaching the prayer Jesus asked the Father to bless even the church today in 2020. Keep them one. Keep them centered on what matters most. Love. Love for God. Love for one another. Serving your neighbor. Going out of our way to to look for opportunities to share the gospel of what sets us free. Of what brings us together. Of the, the banner of Christ that we all fall under. And in Acts 8, this unity is really happening. But it's not happening because they're all gathering together in one location. Unity is happening as they scatter... And tell the story that's so changed their lives. And people from all walks of life step into the family of God throughout the rest of the book of Acts as the church explodes through salvation. You know, sometimes I think we think unity can happen best when we're in each other's presence. And that's an incredible gift. But in Acts chapter 8, Dr. Luke, he's looking back historically at what happened in the earliest days of the church. He's done all these interviews, all this research. He's a very technical guy. He's, got, he's a doctor, and he's describing, not prescribing, not telling us how to understand how God works and who he is, but he's just telling us the narrative of what happened in the Acts of the Apostles, the first three decades of the church's existence. And he's telling us in summary for him after it happened. And when he looks back historically, he says, here's what happened. Persecution broke out. Church members scattered from Jerusalem. And when they did it, the church actually increased. And, and it, was, I, I, it was unified around this mission of being sent out, the incarnation of God, the incarnation of the church. He says, history tells a story of the church body getting stronger through separation. The church body exploding at this moment. And in Acts 8, Luke tells us of this unity in spirit that God was authoring. Not when the gatherings in Jerusalem were continuing, but when they were stopping. So in verse 4, where we left off last week, Luke says, The believers who were scattered, left Jerusalem, all but the apostles, preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Now Luke is about to, starting in verse 5, throughout the rest of chapter 8 and chapter 9, he's going to tell us about three specific powerful stories of three individuals where the good good news spreads and salvation is found by three people that are the most unexpected, the most unlikely from very different walks of life. Luke is going to tell us how the family of God will scatter and will now start to include people like a Samaritan sorcerer. And uh, and an Ethiopian eunuch. And one of the Jewish temple rulers. Now you can hear me kind of read a list of these three people and think, okay, so what? Yeah, So whatever a a Samaritan sorcerer is and whatever an Ethiopian eunuch is and a Jewish temple ruler. But, but, But let's stop there and let me help you try to understand something. At this moment in history, there is no, we have tables in the room. There is no table where these three people in this culture would ever sit down together, ever. They would be so isolated and separated from one another, they'd want nothing to do with each other. 
A Samaritan sorcerer that's dabbling in the occult and demonic practices and spirits. An Ethiopian eunuch from Africa, wealthy and powerful, with prominence in his home nation, to be able to travel to Jerusalem, seeking the one true God, the God of Israel, and then going back. He's actually holding some of the, the, the book of Isaiah to actually carry the Bible. There's no printing press. There's no access to the Bible. There's no Amazon, right? You can't even download it to a Kindle. But, but he's got a scroll of a copy of Isaiah, This is somebody that's incredibly wealthy. He's got connections in high places, and he's reading it on the road. And then one of the leading rulers of the Jewish council that was not only Jewish, but he was also a Roman citizen. So he kind of had a foot in both camps, and he had influence. There was not a table in the world that these three would sit down and get to know each other. They had no reason to even be in one another's company. They wouldn't even necessarily want to be around one another until they encounter the gospel of Jesus. And it so transforms them each that they would call one another brothers in Christ. A part of the same family. Whole new identity. A whole new understanding of father and son and daughter and family. See, this is the power of God at work to cross the most extreme and challenging boundaries that so often in our sin are built up in the world around us, even to this day. So let's continue on into to what Luke writes in Acts chapter 8 and verse 5, and let's see what the Holy Spirit does here. First, Luke introduces us to Philip. Now, we met Philip in Acts chapter 6. There are, let me be clear too, there's two Philips. There's Philip, the, one of the original apostles, and then there's Philip, who's one of the deacons that was added to the team, one of the seven in Acts 6, like Stephen, that was added to help uh, feed the widows. And so this is Philip the deacon, not Philip, one of the original apostles. There's two Philips. And, and so Philip knew Stephen well. He was serving alongside Stephen. Now all of a sudden, Stephen is murdered. And Luke tells us, everyone except the original apostles scatter from Jerusalem. That involves Philip. And Luke is about to tell us how the ministry of Philip, an ordinary average guy who now is removed from the congregation that he was kind of hired to help serve, we're going to hear where his story goes. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah. Now here we go. This is an interesting one. Because Luke, going all the way back to Acts 1, he tells us, you'll receive power when my spirit comes. Jesus said, you, my disciples, will receive power when my Holy Spirit comes to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, all of a sudden, we're hearing in Acts chapter 8 that when they scatter, there's one guy, Philip, that is actually going to Samaria, as Jesus said they should. Now, if you remember from last week, I kind of identified really quickly Samaritans were enemies of the Jews. And the reason they were at odds with one another, the reason there was tension and conflict between the Jews and the Samaritans is because the Samaritans were actually kind of half Jewish. Uh, Going all the way back to the Assyrian invasion when they kind of overwhelmed Israel and then they kind of held Israel in bondage, there were Jews living in the region of Samaria, still practicing their faith, but now all of a sudden they're restricted and there's other Assyrians living in their towns. And as they live there for a few decades, their kids grow up and they intermarry with Assyrians and their grandkids grow up and now they're intermarrying with Assyrians. And so from a Jewish perspective, they look at the Samaritans as a pollution to the God-ordained lineage of the Hebrew people going all the way back to Abraham, the lineage that God would deliver the Messiah from through. And they wanted to keep that lineage pure from any outsiders. The Jewish people hated the Samaritans. They saw them as, as an abomination. They despised them. They wanted to nothing to do with them because they tainted their bloodline with foreigners. And so much, not, not only was it kind of a biological blending, but there was a, there was a faith, a spiritual blending as well. Because the, 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 the faith of the Hebrew people living in Samaria did not stay crystal clean, focused on Jehovah, the God of Israel that rescued them from Egypt and brought them into the promised land. No, it kind of, they took the faith of the Hebrews and they kind of took the faith of the Assyrians, which was very much polytheistic and idolatry, and they kind of just mashed them together and it was just this weird kind of combined element of what it looked like to have faith in gods, many gods. And so from the perspective of the Hebrews, waiting for the arrival of Messiah, hoping for the arrival of Messiah, living in the Roman Empire, they despised, they hated the Samaritans. They they thought they were half-breeds. So I want you to understand, I hope that understanding a little more of the dynamics and the history, the friction, the conflict between the Jews and the Samaritans, I hope that it kind of makes the text of the New Testament come alive a little more, not just here in Acts chapter 8, but even before this. Because what we see in God, what we see in Jesus directly, is he moves against 
the boundaries that culture had set in his day. He moves against them spiritually, but we also see here, Jesus begins to move actively against racial divisions that existed in his day. For instance, Jesus was a rabbi. He was a Jewish holy man. His primary means of of teaching was as a storyteller. And one of the most famous and impactful stories he ever told has to do with loving your neighbor. Who really is your neighbor? And what does it really like to go out of your way to love your neighbor? And so Jesus told a story that Dr. Luke wrote in his gospel on Jesus, the book of Luke, before the the, the book of Acts. In chapter 10 of Luke, uh, Jesus tells this story, and Luke writes it down, of, of a man leaving Jerusalem, heading to Jericho. And after he leaves the city of Jerusalem on his way, he's attacked by bandits, by robbers, and, and they rob him, they beat him, they even take his clothes, and they leave him naked on the side of the road, left to die. And as the man is lying there, Jesus says, all of a sudden there's a priest that comes by. And the Jewish listening audience to Jesus telling this parable would say, oh good, there's someone coming to help this guy. This is what it means to love your neighbor. And Jesus says the priest saw him. He saw that he was clinging to life. And the priest just crossed the road and walked by him on the other side. Ignored him. And they would have been puzzled at that. He said a little bit while later, a Levite came, which is another Jewish religious holy man. And they would have said, oh surely he's going to be the one. And Jesus says, but he saw the man in his plight and just crossed over the other side of the road and passed him by and left him behind. Ignored him. They'd be like, really? Oh, poor guy. Then Jesus says, then a Samaritan came by. And at that word, the Hebrews who were listening to that story literally would have thrown up in their mouth a little, like, oh, not one of them. Jesus says, and the Samaritan stopped. You could have felt the temperature in the, in the huddle increase. Because there would have been people that, Samaritans aren't heroes. There's no way the Samaritan can be the good guy in this story. Jesus says he helps this guy. He doesn't just help him and go on, but he gets off his donkey, lifts this guy up who can't walk. He puts him on his donkey. He walks and he takes this man to a place where he can get help and healing. But rather than just drop him off and say, I hope it works out and feel good about himself, he says, no, I'm going I'm to invest in his healing. I'm going to pay for it until he's well. I mean, Jesus is a great storyteller and he throws these twist endings that catch people off guard. Jesus is moving against their, their racial divisions. Or even prejudice that they don't even, they might be unconscious to. They may be subconscious reactions to the way they think. Jesus was always tearing down walls that separated people. It's beautiful. And then he asks this question in verse 36. He asks this to the crowd, which do you think of these three was a neighbor to the man that fell into the hands of robbers? And the undeniable answer is it's the good Samaritan to which then Probably some of the audience wouldn't have just thrown up in their mouth. They would have vomited on the ground because it would have made them sick. But, and even some of those listening would have been angry at the very thought of this. But, but see, this isn't the only time Jesus kind of challenges the status quo. Let me remind you of a second event early on in his ministry in John 4 where his disciples looked on and said, what, what are you doing, dude? What are you doing? There was friction at the time with Jesus and the Pharisees. So much so, that, and Jesus knew it wasn't his time to go to Jerusalem and be crucified. So they go to Galilee further away to, to do ministry. Um, which is on kind of the, the northern tier where invaders would come through into the region of Galilee. It was a place nobody wanted to live, but if you were stuck living, it was a very hard place to live. And that's why Jesus spends so much time with those kind of marginalized, and he does ministry there. But in order to get there from where they were, they had to go through Samaria. And it's here that Jesus, a Jewish holy man, starts up a conversation, a beautiful conversation, with a woman at a well. And sure enough, she's a Samaritan. This is a big no-no. A big no-no for for a Hebrew man to have a conversation with a Samaritan woman, but a big no-no in that he's a Jewish holy man having a conversation with someone deemed unclean. But Jesus gets even more uh, controversial than that in that he asks the woman to to give him something, to give him a drink, truly making himself unfit for worship in their Jewish world. And her response initially is like, do you... Who do you think you are? Like People like you don't talk to people like me. People like me sure don't talk to people like you. We hate each other. But see, Jesus is not like everyone else. He's not drawing the lines, the social walls everyone else is drawing. He is building something. He's modeling something to these disciples that they've never seen before. He's building a church that he's going to pray, God, keep them unified. Make them one. Don't let them divide like the world around them divides. Let love for one another and for outsiders overwhelm the boundaries and lines that the sin of mankind continues to set. 
But there's even a third event. And it's really an even more extreme one because it shows us the difference between the perspective of these disciples who have been following Jesus for a while and Jesus himself. And Luke records it in his gospel in chapter 9. Jesus and the disciples are passing through another Samaritan village. And of all the 12 disciples, James and John, yes, the same James and John we've been talking about, the first seven chapters, Peter, James, and John, two of the three most prominent leaders in the days of of the church in its earliest days, James and John literally look to Jesus as they're passing through this Samaritan town. And you may not even realize, this happens so quickly in one verse, you may not even realize this has ever been there. But they look at Jesus and they're like, hey, Jesus, do you want us to have a prayer meeting right now? And we can like ask God to send down fire to burn up all these Samaritans? And Jesus quickly rebukes them. He's like, do you know how evil your hearts are? The hatred that seizes you? He says, the Son of Man has not come to earth to destroy lives, but to save lives. Jesus is moving against social walls, racial divisions. He's not just raising a hand and saying, yeah, I don't agree with that. I I oppose that. He's actively moving against it. He's trying to build bridges with people. And those who he has influence, in his sphere of influence, he's inviting them to join him on that journey of building bridges with people that aren't like them. Because he wants to rescue them. You know, the greatest assault on racism, a topic that is all over our news cycles and has been for a few months, the greatest assault on racism in human history was not the birth of a nation or a policy or a procedure. It was the birth of the church. Here in Acts 8, we're seeing in our earliest days, the Holy Spirit is leading the way for the children of God who have scattered from the Jewish capital into Judea and Samaria Places not like them, and they're sharing the gospel with anybody that will listen, no matter how different they are. And people are desperate to hear the story of the rumors they've heard about Jerusalem. You were there, you saw Jesus, you were there for his death, you were there for his resurrection, you've you've experienced Pentecost. You were there when they were meeting daily in the temple courts, when thousands were getting baptized. What was that like? What was happening? People are hungry to know the truth of what was really happening. So this is the context of the story of Simon the sorcerer coming to faith. Verse 5, Philip, as an example, the deacon went to Samaria to tell the people about the Messiah. Verse 6, and crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and eager to see the miraculous signs he did. Many evil spirits were cast out, screaming as they left their victims, and many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. With Philip came great joy to the city. There was great joy in that city. A man named Simon, who'd been a sorcerer there for many years, amazing the people of Samaria, the region, claiming to be someone great. Verse 10, everyone from the least to the greatest in Samaria often spoke of Simon as the great one. This is interesting that the language that's used as we translate it into English, even the power of God. They're not saying he is a great one. They're not saying he has access to the power of God. They literally look at him as a deity. I mean, they're highly polytheistic. Like, this guy is a God, the power of God. That's who he is. That's his identity. That can be the only explanation why Simon can do what Simon can do. And so as a result, verse 11 says, they listened closely to him because for a long time he had astounded them with his magic. Now, let me touch on something here for just a second. You know, Satan is a deceiver. The demons are deceivers. We see this so clearly in Satan's temptation of Jesus trying to deceive Jesus to kind of pervert the word of God, to kind of make it say something it doesn't say, so that Satan can deceive Jesus into rebelling against his father. And and Jesus comes through those 40 days of temptation clear. He doesn't sin as we fall to sin. But it is so true that people throughout history have flirted with demonic powers in this world that seem to be on the outside spectacular, amazing, unbelievable, and even, especially in our day, there's TV shows like, wow, it's so entertaining. But you need to understand, there is a darkness, a facade of darkness that it's wrapped in. They want to deceive. They want it to look spectacular. That those in opposition to the mission of God to rescue people from darkness, demons and Satan, they want it to look entertaining. They want people to lean in and give it legitimacy because they can deceive them through the applause of people. That's where Simon was. He was receiving the applause of people in Samaria, thinking he was great, thinking he was all that. But he's about to encounter the reality of who Jesus is. And he's about to encounter 
real power, the Holy Spirit's power. Verse 12, Simon had done all this. He got a lot of influence in Samaria. But now the people believed Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. As a result, many men and women were baptized. Verse 13, then Simon himself believed and was baptized. He couldn't deny what they were saying about Jesus. He began following Philip wherever he went. He was hungry. He was amazed by the signs and great miracles Philip performed. He, he's seeing what Philip can do. An ordinary, average guy, not a lifetime trickster like Simon was. And what's, what, what, what Philip can do is far beyond what Simon is capable of. He can't begin to imagine it. He's fascinated. Verse 14, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. Now, we can just read that as a part of the narrative, but we've got to stop. It is impossible to overstate verse 14. Get this, the original 12, 12 apostles of Jesus, the original 12 disciples, 11, one of them you know, didn't work out so well and they had to replace him. So the 12 apostles of Jesus have stayed in Jerusalem and they hear through the grapevine that, that there is something happening in Samaria. And they probably would have said, where? Samaria. No, no. Where? Samaria. God is up to something in Samaria. The gospel is being accepted and people are responding. They're getting saved. They're getting baptized. Now, if you remember back to the time of Jesus, there were times where they would go into some cities and there would be a warm welcome and people receptive to the ministry of Jesus and the proclamation of the gospel. There'd be other cities and towns they'd go into and, and there would just be resistance. There would be no faith. They couldn't do miracles. Jesus said, that's it. We've got to move on. It, it kind of Kick the dust off of your boots and move on. They don't have ears to hear or eyes to see. And now all of a sudden, the disciples who are still staying in Jerusalem, even after Jesus gave them the command in Acts 1.8, you need to leave Jerusalem, you need to go to Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. They're still there and they send, we talked about last week, the sending nature of God. They send Peter and John. Not two of the sideline guys, you know. Two of the top three in the church at this time. You guys got to go there. You got to see what's happening and you got to bring back the story. And Peter and John are now heading for the one place they would never intend to go because of the report of what the Holy Spirit's doing there. What does this mean? They're wondering as they're making this journey. What does this mean that the Spirit of God is moving in and among our enemies? Half breeds. People that are not Hebrew, but they're considered to be Gentiles outside of the promises of the God of Israel. What's happening? If this is true, if they are genuinely responding to the gospel, what does this mean for the church? What's the Holy Spirit doing? And what's going to happen when we get there? Verse 15, Luke says, as soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers and they received the Holy Spirit. It's a powerful moment where, where th these half-Jewish people who'd previously been excluded from the kingdom of God, now those kind of picked to carry the mantle of, of God's love and mercy and grace into the future as leaders within the church, they're laying hands on these formerly half-Jewish people and there is racial reconciliation happening in their midst. And they welcome these new believers into the family of God. And in this moment of reconciliation... We begin to realize the scope and the movement of Christianity as the Spirit of God shows up in a special way that Luke captures, describing these moments. Like the pleasure of God is just blessing this reconciliation. And remember, Simon the sorcerer, he's watching all of this. He's witnessing all of it. When Simon saw that the, verse 18, when Simon saw the Spirit was given when the apostles laid their hands on people, I mean, the remnant of Simon's old life came back to the surface. He offered them money to buy this power. Verse 19, Simon says, let me have this power too, so that when I lay my hands on people, they'll receive the Holy Spirit. This is amazing, incredible. I want to be a part of it. Now, Simon's a new believer. He's still figuring out who God is, who Jesus is, what the Holy Spirit is, and what, what the Holy Spirit can do, who this three-person fold understanding of, of God is. His old life is still lingering during that discovery process. 
I mean, the old Simon, he made his living off of parlor tricks and dark magic, and he just kind of subconsciously responds to what he's seeing and the evidence of the Holy Spirit that he's so amazed with, and he just wants to know, how can I do what you guys have done? Do I need to pay you for this? Because in his mindset within a Samaritan worldview, there was this idea of the God of Israel, but then there were all these other gods, these other idols, and so if you wanted something from them, you had to do what they asked you to do, or you had to pay what they asked you to pay, and then if you did it, you would get what it was that you wanted. It's a very self-centered, me-centric idea of, of, of the gods, the many gods, small g. So he's got to learn what this means. And Peter responds and tells him. He, he basically says, says, this power is not for you, for yourself. It's a power God uses through you for the benefit of others to set them free. And, and Peter's first words, remember we talked about throughout the history of this series, Peter sometimes would stick his foot in his mouth, right? He'd speak before he thought. You know, we talked about on the day of Pentecost, all of a sudden he stands up to proclaim the gospel and the disciples are off to the side like, oh man, this is a train wreck. One of us should have stepped up to the, to the, to the, the microphone, right? And then Peter starts to go into the gospel and what God was preparing and then he had to suffer and die and he's kind of looking over at the disciples the whole time and this is going pretty well. And they're like, yeah, this is going pretty well. Like, we're all surprised by this. Well, he just says sometimes things that are maybe rough and abrasive. That's part of who he is. It's part of what God was using, his boldness to just speak. And here he says something pretty abrasive to a new believer. Verse 20, Peter says, May your money be destroyed with you, for thinking God's gift can be bought. There's another translation of this, the Phillips translation, that literally takes the, the original Greek here and says it in an even more abrupt way. It says, May you and your money go to hell. He says, you can have no part in this, for your heart is not right with God. Verse 22, repent of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he'll forgive your evil thoughts, for I can see that you are full of bitter jealousy and are held captive by sin. He's talking about this battle between the old life and this new life in his choices. And Simon responds, he says, pray for me. Pray to the Lord for me that these terrible things you've said won't happen. I mean, we see this response from Simon, and it's, it, it, it's, it's identifying the Holy Spirit's convicting his spirit. He didn't know this. He, he's listening to Peter's rebuke, and, and we see Simon is hungry to learn about who God is. That's why he was following Philip everywhere. He wants to know who God is and who God is not. He wants to know what's okay and what's not okay, and he wants to experience heart change. He doesn't want to be in bondage to sin. He wants to break free from it. He doesn't want to be held captive. He doesn't want to be driven by that selfish desire and sin. His eyes are are opening. The Hebrew people at this time were living in a world that was polarized. Tribes living with their tribes, interacting with their tribes, and isolated from the rest of the world. And literally one of the first things the movement of the Spirit of God does as the church begins to scatter outside of Jerusalem As the family of God expands and scatters, God establishes the gospel message. It moves against division. Jesus prayed about unity. It was his final words before he's arrested. His final prayer, multiple times, make them one, keep them one. Even though in the midst of what they're about to experience, may they not lose their oneness. Don't let them be divided. When we look at Jesus, we see someone who lived a life engaging people on the margins, people that were oppressed or neglected, who felt unheard or unseen, that needed help. Those are who Jesus would help. People desperately hungry, looking for God. At the very beginning, we see the gospel of Jesus. It's powerful enough to withstand being separated from one another and to learn to be reliant on the Holy Spirit, to survive being isolated, but even... More than that, as the church scatters outside of Jerusalem in every direction, the church begins to thrive in that isolation. Because now they're desperate for God in a way in which they weren't when it was comfortable in Jerusalem. In the first generation of the church, through the power of the Spirit, bridges are built across lines that had never been breached before in history. Peter and John are sent to Samaria to see the latest miracle of God at work. And what they find is the most effective and attractive part of the church was their love for one another and their love for people who were not yet believers. Their willingness to build relationships with them and invite them into community so that the the way they loved God and loved one another would be an experience for them that they could step into faith and salvation in Jesus. 
And then Luke writes one statement before he transitions to talk about the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip's interaction with him. In verse 25, Luke says this as kind of a transition. It says, after testifying and preaching the word of the Lord in Samaria, Peter and John kept traveling to far off cities. No, they go back to Jerusalem, which is kind of funny. But along the way, they stop in many Samaritan villages to preach the good news. Now, I think this is awesome because it's almost as if now Peter and John understand what the Spirit of God is up to, what he's building. They didn't stop. We're not told they stopped in Samaritan villages on their way to connect with Philip. In fact, when they passed through other Samaritan villages to get to Philip, they might have been throwing up in their mouth a little. But when they saw what God was doing, that it was an authentic move of his Spirit, Once they left, they understood the gospel. It couldn't stay there anymore. It had to scatter. That the family of God is designed by God to multiply and scatter. And so they stopped at Samaritan villages along the way to invite others into the gospel. A couple of takeaways. Adversity drove the Christians to go where they otherwise never would have gone. We are so quick to want to avoid adversity and yet sometimes it's the difficulties we face in life that take us as followers of Jesus following him to places we would otherwise never maybe be willing to go or acknowledge. And the second one, we can't stay here anymore. Their actions and attitudes were a bridge. The way they responded in light of what they were experiencing, their actions, their attitudes, their responses were a bridge the truth of God could travel on. They couldn't stay where they were anymore. They had to move. A movement moves. This is the same sentiment that we have to carry as followers of Jesus today, as disciples. And I just want to ask you kind of a reflection question. Are you comfortable in your Jerusalem right now? Are you comfortable? Are you trying to build a predictable life that you're trying to control the outcome of? Or are you building an obedient life that you know only God can control? See, we, we have a... We have a tendency to think, and there's seasons where where the blessing of God and the comforts of life can blend in with obedience to God, but more often than not, obeying God is uncomfortable. It's not based on fact. It doesn't make sense. It's based on faith. And stepping out in faith is not normally comfortable. It's a challenge. Are you comfortable in your Jerusalem? Are you going? Are you being sent? You can't stay where you are anymore. This is essential to what it means to be a disciple, growing in discipleship. Because God will always be calling us to a place we never planned to go. He'll be calling us to a people or a person we maybe never would have dreamed we would go. And they might be like you in Judea, but there's also going to be many that are not like you. That require more patience from you than from them. That require more listening from you than talking. That require more grace and you really want to give, that require more love and mercy, that require more self-control. Why? Because that's the fruits of God's Spirit being birthed in us. That we shouldn't expect to be birthed in a lost world that's going to hate us because we're not like them. Is it tough? Yeah. Is it hard? Yeah. But the tough, hard things in life are where the adventure lies, not in the comforts. Let's pray. Jesus, worship is a choice. Sometimes we can kind of get up, caught up in the pattern of how we do gatherings. and you know, We even define singing as worship. And man, worship is so much more than that. That we can't worship you in song if there's not a lifestyle of putting you first in all things. So we can really be captivated by worshiping you in song. And Lord, if we're honest, sometimes the circumstances in our lives leave us to a place where we say, I don't, I don't want to worship right now. I don't want to glorify you, God, because I'm not seeing where this is good news. May you help us to see, Lord, that even through the struggles, even through the bad news, you can work. And that the challenge for us as your children is to be obedient in all seasons, to go wherever it is you would have us to go, believing that you have a plan, you have a design. And not only do you want to do something through us and the lives of others, which is why you're sending us, But even more, you want to do stuff in us that won't happen any other way. God, as we close with this song, may we choose to worship you now. No matter what we're facing in our life, knowing that the fact that the promise that you go with us through it all. And 
you bless us through it all. And moving outside of our comfort zone is where the adventure lies in following you. In your holy name I pray. I choose to worship, I choose to bow, though there's pain in the offering, I lay it down, here in the conflict, when doubt surrounds, though my soul is unraveling, I choose you now. I will praise you through the fire, through the storm, and through the flood. There is nothing that could ever steal my song. In the valley, you are worthy. You are good when life is not. You will always and forever be my song. My altar right here and now in the midst of the darkest night it won't burn out for you are perfect no matter what in the joy of the suffering praise you through the fire through the storm and through the flood there is nothing that could ever steal my soul in the valley you are worthy you are good when life is not you will always and forever be my soul when the enemy says I'm done, I lift my praises. When the world comes crashing down, I lift my praises. I, till the darkness turns to dawn, I lift my praises. I choose to worship. I choose you now. When the enemy Says I'm done, I lift my praises. When my world comes crashing down, I lift my praises. I till the darkness turns to dawn, I lift my praises. I choose to worship, I choose you now, I choose to worship. I choose you now. I will praise you through the fire, through the storm, and through the flood. There is nothing that could ever steal my soul. In the valley, you are worthy. You are good when life is not. You will always forever be my song. Well, before we dismiss you, uh, the kids have come back in, and, and we just want to share a couple quick things with you about uh, some schedule changes that are going to happen over the next few weeks. You can have a seat for a second. Uh, next Sunday is going to be our last Sunday where we're doing outside at 9, inside at 11. Um, we're going to go back to 9 and 11 inside after Labor Day, so they'll both be inside, and we're going to relaunch our 5.30 worship gathering, which will be the drive-in service. So for those that are really comfortable and enjoy being outside, as long as the weather permits, we're going to kind of keep doing 5.30 outside in the drive-in format and uh, probably even move back into some, some of the dinner church model where people can bring a meal and kind of eat together during the course of of a, a different worship gathering than the 9 and the 11. Um, uh, next week, so we'll do 9 outside, 11 inside, mass optional. And then on Labor Day weekend, just to remind you, it'll be one combined gathering at 10 a.m. at Camp Pinnacle in Voorheesville. It's about 45 minutes from here. Uh, and there's a lot of things happening on Saturday and Sunday. Saturday night, we're going to have a time of worship up on Sunset Ridge where you can see the sun go down. It's beautiful. Uh, time of worship and testimonies up there. 
Uh, there's horseback riding and paintball as well as you can come and just swim in the pool. There's a lot of things to do for free. A couple of things like the paintball and horseback riding costs a little bit. But there's a lot of information on our webpage. And then if you click on the links for registration, that goes through all the details uh, with those things. Uh, but just go to fusioncommunity.church forward slash reunion and you can find that page. Um, so that's happening over the next few weeks. Just be aware of that. The 10 a.m. from Camp Pinnacle will be live streamed for all of you that are online or those of you that can't join us. It will be available online to participate. But it's an outdoor stage, outdoor worship, Labor Day Sunday, September 6th at 10 a.m. You can stay in your car, bring lawn chairs. Then we're also offering kind of a, a potluck dinner after. You can bring your own picnic lunch if you want, or you can participate in the food that's going to be there, uh, people bringing dishes to pass and, and all of that. So that'll be happening that weekend as well. All right? Uh, would you stand with me? We're just going to close in a word of prayer as the worship team kind of ends us in, in live music and sends us out. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for this opportunity to gather in your presence today. We thank you for the gift of gathering. God, it, it wasn't that long ago that being in each other's presence was, was restricted. And so we're, we're just so grateful to get to, to be in each other's presence, to sense your spirit, to worship, to listen, uh, to praise you, to pray. God, we, we pray, though, that as we gather today, that it would feed the scattering as each of us go to our circle of influence today. The mission field that we have, God, is not in this building. This is just a tool for ministry. The mission field you've called us to is outside of this place. So would you send us out on fire for the mission of God, knowing that the power to live out that mission is not found in ourselves. It's found only in your Holy Spirit, that pneuma, that fresh breath, that fresh wind in our sails. And we would do everything we do and everywhere we go, we would be looking for opportunities to share about the love of Jesus that so radically changed our lives. In your holy name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed. See you next Sunday. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain.